Good afternoon and welcome to today's session. Today we have with us for the invited talk, Professor Kartikian Bhargavan from India, Paris. And for this session, we have two session chairs with us, Professor Lant Kuster and Dr. Jay Prakash Kaur. So we welcome you all and over to you to the session chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. So welcome everybody to the last day of Indocrypt. Um, as usual, we start uh, with an invited talk, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Karthik Bhagavan uh, as today's invited speaker. Um, Karthik is a research director at INRIA Paris, and with no doubt, one of the leading researchers in the field of tool-based verification of cryptographic protocols. And more generally, uh, um, his research lies at the intersection of programming languages, software verification, and applied cryptography. So Karthik not only analyzes abstract models of cryptographic protocols, but actually looks at their implementation. And he also produces verified protocol implementations. So he has developed and also co-developed many influential verification methods and tools and used them to analyze highly security critical protocols, which are really at the heart of today's security infrastructure. For example, he has been heavily involved in the analysis of TLS, discovered many attacks on TLS, uh, like Logjam and Freak and others, um, and has helped to improve the new TLS 1.3 standard we uh, all rely on. So Karthik has received many prestigious awards and really too many to uh, mention them all. Uh, for example, the Lifchin Prize for Real World uh, Cryptography and the Horizon Impact Award of the Re European Commission. So without further ado, uh, welcome with me, Dr. Karthik Bhagavan. Karthik, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ralph. Uh, thank you so much for those kind words. Um, so today uh, I'm going to be presenting some work which is uh, in collaboration with many, many other authors at INRIA, Microsoft Research, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and the University of Stuttgart, including Ralph himself. And the theme of the talk today is high assurance and high performance crypto software. Okay. So what I posit is that we, what I think of, we are in what, what I think of as a golden era for the design and deployment of new crypto schemes, new crypto software. What do I mean by this? Well, every website today is uh, has to implement HTTPS, which means it's using cryptographic protocols like TLS, Quick, and Acme underneath it. Every person in the room and on Zoom is uh, definitely using multiple secure messengers, including uh, Signal, WhatsApp, Skype, whatnot. And of course, we all hear a lot about and perhaps too much about cryptocurrencies of various kinds, but that's just the state today. And there's a lot more coming on, right? There's like new post-quantum crypto schemes that are being standardized right now, lightweight crypto schemes, multi-party computations, for fully homomorphic encryption. All of these are coming out from research into the light of day and slowly but surely getting widely deployed. So these are all the exciting things happening, right? But let's go back to something uh, which is very boring. The quintessential cryptographic software, which is so boring that we don't even think of it as cryptographic software, is your web browser. So this morning, I went to my SBI account, and this is the page that comes in front of me, right? It asks me to put in my username, password, capture, it'll give me an OTP, and it get, tells me, be vigilant, be safe, and uh, allows me to get into my bank account. So what gives me the confidence to uh, access this account, to do my transfers, and these kinds of things? It's the little lock on top, right? And if I kind of dig into the little lock in the Firefox developer console, what I'll see is that, well, that lock basically means that we're using HTTPS, which means there is a secure channel between my browser and the bank. And the secure channel is implemented using TLS 1.2, which internally uses a uh, Diffie-Hellman construction, a signature construction, an authenticated encryption construction, notably uh, NIST P256 for Diffie-Hellman, RSA for signatures, and ASGCM for encryption. So this gives me a lot of details. But how exactly does it work, right? And if I try to give you a high-level idea of how TLS 1.2 works, and in fact, this is how TLS from the time it used to be called SSL in 1994, all the way till it was TLS 1.2 until 
2017 even used to work is very, very simple. Okay, so the, the protocol is on the right. You and I could have probably written this protocol in the 1980s, uh, definitely by the 1990s, and nobody would be surprised. So the browser sends a nonce, the server sign creates a Diffie-Hellman key shared G to the power Y, and signs that along with a couple of nonces. The client then sends its own Diffie-Hellman key shared G to the X. Both parties can compute G to the power XY and derive a key from this. And this is the key we are going to use to encrypt data in both directions. So if you look at that, uh, that protocol, it's a very classic secure channel construction. It's an authenticated key exchange followed by authenticated encryption. There are many variations of this, but really there's, uh, this is like very well studied. There are many, many proofs. In fact, it, most of the uh, proto uh, protocols in the ITF, including IPsec and TLS were all inspired by Sigma, which was developed and proved and settled in 2003 which means that by the time TLS 1.2 came out in 2008, this for many people was considered a solved problem, at least cryptographically from the design point of view. This is classic, this is solved, this is verified in many different ways, except it isn't, right? Between just the five-year zone I'm looking at here, and this is not even an exhaustive list, between 2011 and 2016, this is a subset of the attacks with names, logos, and high profile, news articles that were made on TLS deployments. So there was this beautiful high-level protocol with many security proofs. And then there are these deployments with like these bazillion attacks. So what's going on? What is this gap between the theoretical protocol and the realistic deployment that is giving rise to all these attacks? It's worth digging into this before we decide how we can improve the situation. So what goes wrong between this high-level protocol and the low-level uh, implementation and deployment? Well, in order to take your uh, nice theoretical design and get it into production, there are many steps you have to go through. The first one, which I'm afraid I kind of, I insist my students do, but, uh, but, but many of us don't, is to say, well, you can't just give me a protocol without telling me what algorithms you're gonna use, right? Let's instantiate all the crypto constructions in your protocols with the concrete crypto algorithms you're going to use. Which means you also have to make some high level choices like, what kind of key exchange should I use? Shall I use a post quantum chem because it's really cool? Or should I use ECDH because that's now widely deployed? Should I use for authentication a signature scheme or shall I use a pre-shared key because that would be much faster? For authenticated encryption, well, of course, today it's pretty much settled. You should use some kind of AEAD scheme, but even then, how do we generate the norms for the AEAD scheme? This is not really clear and each protocol makes its own decision about this. So you have to make these decisions about how you're going to instantiate and use the crypto algorithm to, to implement your protocol. And there are many, many possibilities, dozens of possibilities. Each of them has subtly different security guarantees. And there are many ways of getting it wrong. And that's kind of, that accounts for about half the attacks on the list I showed you before, which is that there were some broken, outdated crypto algorithms being used and they shouldn't have been used, you know, at least in that form, in that protocol. Okay, so now you have fixed all the crypto algorithms. What's the next step? Well, the next step is that you want your protocol to be used by many different people. So you want an interoperable protocol standard. So you want to have a document which anybody can read and implement, right? Otherwise you'll have only one implementation, which might be okay in some certain niche cases, but for a protocol like TLS, you want to have a standard which everybody can follow. It's well documented. And the standard is much more than the tiny little figure I showed you. First of all, you have to fix all your message formats. So all the messages, including the things you're going to put inside signatures, inside encryption, have to be have an unambiguous formatting. And this is important for security. Otherwise, you could take a signature meant for one purpose and actually send it where a signature was expected for a different purpose, and this would be an attack. It may not appear in your high-level model, but it certainly will appear in, you'll have to account for it in your standard. And then you might want to have agility in your standard. You might want to support different kinds of authentication modes, different kinds of cipher suits. And this again is important because of the politics of the thing. One company might prefer this algorithm, another company might prefer a different algorithm, and you might have to support both in your standard. And the third one, which is somewhat boring, and it's important for protocols like TLS, but maybe not important for a brand new protocol you design, is backwards compatibility. So uh, when you're designing something today, it's version one, so you can make it perfect, of course. But 10 years from now, you are going to want version two. And when you have version two, you, would, you shouldn't regret that when you were designing version one, you didn't already design it in a way that you could extend it later. 
And when you're extending it later, you want to be backwards compatible with earlier versions. And this introduces a lot of complexity. So as a result, the published standards of protocols, even if the high level protocol was just a very simple one, like I showed you, ends up being hundreds of pages. And of course, in the corner cases of these protocols, there are going to be problems like downgrade attacks, where you have two versions and somebody can downgrade you from a higher version to a lower version or a key synchronization or an unknown key share attack in many systems. And that accounts for a few of the attacks that I showed you between 2011 and 2016. But perhaps the largest chunk of problems and attacks that you see in the real world does not even come from those two stages. It comes from the last stage. So you have your beautifully specified uh, protocol standard or document well cl clear, clearly defined. You've, uh, you've solved all the problems of design, but now you have to implement this. right? And when you're implementing this, often a big consideration is you want to deploy it on multiple platforms. And a second consideration is you want it to be fast because protocols like TLS in particular, but also VPN protocols, many other kinds of protocols are in fact a performance bottleneck in many systems. This is true in embedded systems where crypto takes most of the time of uh, execution for many of these uh, embedded systems. It's also true for massive server farms, farms like Google and Akamai and Cloudflare where in fact a large chunk of the server uh, processing is in fact in TLS. So you really need to optimize this, which means that you need to have a crypto library that is high performance crypto for multiple platforms. When you're doing message processing and parsing and serialization, you have to be careful to do zero copy parsing and so on. You have to figure out where you're storing your keys and how you're managing your keys across these multiple uh, servers which might be sharing these keys. And then you have to also, of course, implement the protocol state machine, which has to compose all the sub protocols in, a, in the right way without, uh, without any confusions. And all of these are problematic and error prone tasks. Okay? This is not a very easy task to do. And each of these has many, many CVEs in the last few years where people have gotten them wrong. And at the end of this, you end up with a large code base, which is supporting multiple versions, multiple cipher suits. Uh, but also has to be super efficient on every single platform. So you have like different variants and code paths for different platforms. And of course, this is going to result in bugs. So in the crypto layer, the kinds of bugs you see are correctness bugs, memory safety bugs, side channel bugs all over the place. And at the protocol layer, you see problems in terms of how people confuse the state machine and therefore can bypass completely the protocol, or there could be a parsing bug like heart bleed that leads to devastating uh, problems, right? So these are the three stages of going from a high level protocol all the way down to the software that's eventually deployed. And at each stage, you can see that there are many things that can go wrong. So going back to our original thought that we are in a golden era for the design and deployment of new crypto stuff, we also have to temper that with the knowledge that whenever we are designing and deploying new things, many things can go wrong and they do go wrong between our beautiful theoretical design and the real world deployment. And this is our responsibility, you know, as designers, as cryptographers, as, as computer scientists, we have to think, we have to think not just about our, uh, the thing that you're going to put in our paper, but how it's actually going to be used. And to this end, there is this field of research, which is sometimes called computer aided cryptography, where the goal is to build tools and techniques by which we can take the same level of assurance we expect for a theoretical protocol, like the provable security guarantees we expect at, at, in theory, and try to push them as far down the stack as we can all the way to the implementation. Sometimes you can go all the way down to assembly even to give you the same kind of guarantees that you, you got from this beautiful five line protocol that you, that you wrote a game-based proof for. So in the rest of this talk, I'm gonna to try to give you a flavor of what can be done today. What are the open problems? What are the closed problems? not close necessarily, but somewhat solved problems? And how can we use formal methods to build fast, verified crypto protocol implementations, which is what people need in practice. So rather than try to tackle TLS, which as I said already is kind of this boring web browser protocol, let's take the coolest uh, example of crypto protocol that we are all using, right? So the cryptographer's favorite messenger, which is Signal, uh, or at least it should be if you're not using it. Uh, so Signal is a, is a phone app and it does end-to-end -end encryption and you, it uh, guarantees that you don't have to trust the server, right? So that's, uh, that's sort of the, the selling point of it. And uh, if you look under the hood, 
uh, Signal has a very innovative protocol uh, design. It's much more innovative than TLS. And you'll see a few details of this protocol later. In particular, it first has a first phase, which uh, called X3DH, where you establish the initial key. There's a second phase where you keep renewing the key to get, get this uh, interesting property called post-compromise security. And then there is the third phase where you manage, there's a third layer of spec where you manage all the sessions that you have open. So it has detailed documentation, all the code is open source, there are many academic analyses of this protocol. It's not just used in Signal Messenger, it's also used in WhatsApp uses this, Skype uses this, many other products use the same protocol. So it's a really become a kind of a de facto standard in the messaging space. So this seems like an ideal candidate for a higher assurance implementation, right? So all of us are using, whenever we want to send secure messages to each other, we would like to use Signal. Can we prove that the Signal Messenger, which is using all of these interesting crypto things, is secure all the way down to its implementation? To answer this kind of question, we must first unpack the implementation. So if you go, uh, if you actually unpack the Signal uh, app, and look at what it what is there inside its components, what, what makes up the Signal iOS app that is on the iPhone, the Android app is very similar. You'll find that in fact, about 1% of this code is uh, crypto, okay? About 2% of this code is uh, protocol code, 7% is key and session handling, how to manage keys, how to manage sessions, and about 90% is really UI, okay? Uh, and this is not such a surprising breakdown. I would say that any security focused uh, app like Signal would have a similar kind of breakdown. If you take a web browser, of course, the UI app code is much larger, it's millions of lines of code and the crypto code is much smaller. If you go down towards an embedded system, in fact, the crypto code is much, seems much larger because the app code is much smaller. So, but in this domain of security sensitive apps, this is pretty typical. So there's two kinds of note, news we can take from this. The first is, you might say, well, great. We only need to verify 10% of the code, 30,000 lines. Even though Signal itself has 300,000 lines, only 30,000 lines of it is really security critical in the sense that it's, it touches the keys and secrets and stuff. The slightly negative way of looking at it is that, uh, yes, but any bug in the other 90% can still break security. And that's because this is written in Objective C, uh, where there is not really any strong boundaries between the trusted or crypto code and the rest of the uh, rest, rest of the application. But let's be optimistic and let's try to focus on this code that we want to verify. So suppose you took your the application code for something like Signal, and let's identify these four contents. There's a session API, there's key management, there's messaging code. And roughly the top three boxes together are thought of as the protocol implementation. And then there's a crypto library that actually does the crypto uh, algorithms. So what we could do is try to write formal specifications for each of these layers and verify them. So for the crypto library, usually there's a nice mathematical spec in some paper that we can take and we can say, okay, this crypto implementation, even if it is written in C and assembly or whatever to be really fast, really is computing this mathematical function. So we can try to write that spec. For the messaging code, we can take the protocol standard and extract a spec out of it and say, okay, this messaging code is actually implementing this protocol, which is the TLS standard or the signal X3D8 standard or whatever. Then when we go up towards the session API and key management, usually there is no documentation, there is no standard. Every application does its own thing. But the application designer, one might expect, can write down a spec for what they expect should be, how sessions should be handled, how keys should be handled, what the security goals there are, and there might be some spec we can write there. And once we have a spec for what is supposed to happen in these cases, a formal specification, we can try to use some tools to verify that this code, which is ready written for uh, efficiency and uh, deployability, matches this high level spec. And if it doesn't, maybe it means there's a bug, maybe it means there's an attack, okay? So the kinds of questions you want to ask here are actually twofold. The first, does the code on the left match the spec on the right? But then second question you want to ask, does the spec on the right imply security? So if you manage, if you write code that meets the spec, can we prove that then it will actually guarantee the security goals that we expect from, from this application? Okay. So we're gonna ask both these, I'll ask and answer both these kinds of questions uh, over here. So of course, the first question you might ask is, well, okay, you said, uh, you're going to verify the security core. Well, 
uh, how you how do you how can you be sure that you know the rest of the application is not going to mess you up we don't have very good answers for this this is still an open challenge there are some answers in some languages you can say oh, i'm going to use type based abstractions i'm going to use defensive programming or there might be some architectural solutions like i'm going to use an enclave to put the crypto code inside it or i'm going to use some kind of secure compiler which uh, provides isolation guarantees but considering that most of the code that is deployed out there is in languages like c and rust and assembly you really don't get any strong isolation guarantees and isolating out the trusted or verified code from the untrusted or unverified code is still an un, an open challenge so let's focus first uh, part of the talk on this lower layer on how to verify the crypto library against its mathematical spec is the crypto correct so how does one implement crypto right in uh, in practice today so you start from some kind of spec that has been given to you by the nist or ietf or something like that and then you uh, which is so here is the chacha 20 poly 1305 spec from the ietf it's a couple of years old and then you go inside this spec and you find some pseudocode and this is usually written in some python like syntax in most of these specs some of them use slightly different syntax but some kind of pseudocode and looking at that pseudocode you can write to implement it in some a language like c and for cha cha 20 you can implement it in about 100 lines of code it's pretty compact and small it's portable 32 bit uh, c it will run on any platform you can think of uh, and it's reasonably fast i mean it takes uh, about four to nine cycles to encrypt a byte on a, on a relatively modern machine so you could just use that and you're done so the crypto has been implemented but of course that's not good enough because you know your laptop on which you're seeing this or on which i'm presenting actually supports uh, simd vectorization which means single instruction multiple data uh, uh, parallelism which means i can actually process eight blocks of cha cha at the same time okay so if i can do that i can get 5x speed up right so of course i want to do that right so what most implementations do is also have a assembly implementation of chacha 20 which looks something like this which uses exactly the instructions that are available only on intel avx2 compatible machines which are like modern laptops and desktops but hey you have a phone which is running android on an arm chip and you might say oh then i will not get that speed up but no arm also offers its own instruction set called arm neon which can speed up by doing four operations in parallel okay so then you will have a third implementation which uses assembly for arm which does uh, in case somebody is using this on a, on a smartphone so that they can do this uh, about two to three times faster than the C implementation they should. And each of these speed ups is actually critical. I mean, without these speed ups, you would not be able to use things like signal and TLS on your, on your cell phone. Okay. And then of course, every year changes. So, to, uh, so this year, all the laptops coming out from the Intel stable support AVX 5 and 2, all servers support AVX 5 and 2, which means now we can do 16 operations in parallel and get 10x speed up. So this is a never ending kind of evolution where we are going to keep getting new and new platforms, which provide different kinds of instructions, different kinds of speed ups. So people are going to keep implementing these things in different languages and provide multiple implementations. So before you know it, even just for Chacha 20 Poly 1305, which is just one algorithm, you end up with 20,000 lines of code in OpenSSL and Boring SSL. For, because they have code for every single platform that they wish to support. And most of this is an unreadable assembly because this is like highly optimized. It's, it's uh, platform specific using specific optimizations that only appear on that platform. And so it's going to be impossible to audit, test and maintain, right? So this is a state of the crypto library world right now that we are all using actually. So how do we solve this? So the, we advocate the use of formal verification because Otherwise, can we be sure that all of this code is correct? Because there could easily be buffer overflow run, overflows here. There could be timing leaks. There could be arithmetic bugs. And every year, there are many of these. So there are many CVEs and many libraries which are exactly in these three categories. Because someone did not test enough the power PC version of Chacha 20 Poly 1305 on 32-bit machines because it's kind of a corner case and there's a bug there. It may be a corner case for this algorithm, but of course, for the person using PowerPC, this is actually a critical bug. So there is an answer, which is formal verification. So instead of going from the pseudocode directly to your implementation in C or assembly or Rust or whatever language you're writing, writing your code in, you first should develop a formal spec, which is derived from, this, uh, from the uh, standard. 
and prove that this formal spec meets your implementation. And in this verification, you can prove things like, yes, my code is correct. Even if it's this fancy optimized assembly code, I can prove that it is actually implementing this high level mathematical function, which is functional correctness. You should also prove that you're never using accessing memory outside your bounds, which is memory safety. And you can prove things like secret independence, which means that I'm never going to branch on a secret. I'm not going to access a mem memory, uh, an, an array on a, with a secret index. So to in enforce this, what they call constant time coding discipline on the crypto code. So this kind of thing you can verify using a variety of tools. For C, I'm going to show you a tool called Hackle. I mean, go to library called Hackle Star that uses F Star. But there's many other tools like Fiat and so. For assembly, even there are tools that will allow you to do this. So this is how Hacklestar works, the library that we develop in my team. So on one extreme, we have the standard, which is kind of like the RFC. And on the other extreme, you would like to get out optimized code. So what we do, in fact, is first we transcribe the standard as a specification in F star. We call this pure F star. So this purely functional code, no mutable state. Okay. Uh, this code can use high-level notions like sequences. So you don't have mutable arrays, you have sequences. You have mathematical integers with arbitrary precision. And you also have machine integers with fixed precision. So these are the kinds of objects you can modif you can manipulate in your spec, but not much else. Then when you want for the for the C code you want to produce, you in fact write it also in F star, in a sub-language of F star called low star, which has a C-like memory model. So in this low star language, you're not allowed to use arbitrary precision integers, but you can use machine integers and you can use buffers, which are mutable, uh, mutable arrays. And then once you have written these two versions, one is the high level spec and one is the low level implementation with all the optimizations that you want, then you can prove that they match each other. And for this, you use the F star type checker and you prove that there is no memory safety problems, no functional correctness bugs, and that the code is uh, secret independent. And once you have verified this, you can compile the star code down to C or to WebAssembly or even to OCaml if you like. So this whole framework is built around a uh, verification framework and programming language called F star. For those of you who know programming languages like OCaml or Haskell, this is this looks programming in F star is just like that. But in addition, it's also a verification system. So for those of you who know Coq or Isabel or these kinds of programming systems. The F star is both a programming language as well as a verification system of this kind. The main difference is that a lot of the boring proofs in F star are automated or they, they try to automate as much as possible using the Z3 or SMT solver. And although you're programming in a language like OCaml, you can actually compile this out both to OCaml, but also to languages like C and WebAssembly. But different subsets of the language go to different uh, targets. So this makes it an ideal framework for doing both your program development as well as your proof side by side. And this is under active development. I encourage you to look at it if you, uh, if you have time. All right, so using F star, we can develop an entire library. So in 2017, there was already this library of a bunch of algorithms that are all implemented and verified in F star. How fast was it? Well, it's as fast as any handwritten C code, but it was not as fast as assembly code. Why? Because assembly code can use these special instructions like uh, for SIMD vectorization and so on, which it's uh, trickier to do from C code. So this is as fast as existing C code, but not as fast as uh, assembly code. So here, let's take a little pause and say, okay, so what is the state of verified crypto? What are the solved problems? What are the open problems? So today, if you came to me and said, hey, can I download a verified portable C implementation of this algorithm or that algorithm, for many of the standard algorithms, the answer is yes. So it's not just from Hackle Star, but you can go get it from Fiat Crypto, from SOW, from VST, from Jasmine. I mean, you can get a bunch of verified C implementations. But can you be sure that the C compiler preserves the correctness despite the optimizations that the C compiler is going to do? That is an open question. If you use ComCert, you get some guarantees, but you're not guaranteed that the side channel protections in your C code will go all the way down to assembly. There is some active research work in this area. If you're interested, I encourage you to look at uh, these, uh, this line of work on CT Comcert, for example. So let's for C code. What about verified assembly code? I don't want, I want super fast assembly code, but which is verified. Can I get it? Yes, because there are these projects like Vale and Jasmine, which will give you verified assembly crypto code for various algorithms. For the most popular ones, but not necessarily for everything that you need. 
But what if I want a verified implementation of something completely new, like a post-quantum chem or a zero-knowledge proof system or a FHE scheme? This is harder because this is still very much in the, in the level of research. There are not so many implementations of this. You will probably end up doing, this is like a PhD level problem at this point. And can I verify my own implementation if you ask me this? Well, I'm afraid at this stage, the tools that I've described, and there's many, many tools here and many more in the survey paper, require quite a lot of expertise. So it's something that you dedicate several years of your life to, okay? But you can reuse many existing verified components to build your implementation. But if you want to verify by yourself, it still requires quite a lot of PL expertise, I would say at this point. So that's a bit of a negative in terms of usability of these tools, but a lot has already been done. And if you get willing to spend time, you can do a lot too. And then the, the, the last question uh, in this zone is, well, okay, you prove correctness for your code, but what about side channels? There's so, so many side channels out there, right? Timing, power, fault, whatever. And uh, can I prove the absence of these kinds of leaks in my code? For timing, yes, I would consider the problem to be more or less solved. But for almost all the other side channels, this remains an open problem and an exciting problem of research. So if anybody is interested, this is certainly how do you verify the absence of uh, certain kinds of attacks? How do you verify that a countermeasure is preventing, say, a fault uh, attack? This kind of thing is still very much in the uh, hot research. Okay, so that was for the state of the art, but let me show you a little bit about how you can do better. So, so I told you that in our libraries that we have, we have like various versions of each algorithm. Can we verify them all? rather than just verifying one implementation here, one implementation there like I, like Jasmine does or Hackle Star does? The answer is yes. The idea is you want to write once the code, verify it once, and then compile it for in, in optimized implementations for each of these platforms. And that's the idea behind this project called Hackle XN with a paper uh, at ACM CCS 2020, where we write generic SIMD parallelizable code. So even when we first write the code, we don't write it scalar. We write it in a way that it can be parallelized, okay? But then you can instantiate it. One of the instantiations is scalar code, but the other instantiations are vectorized parallelized code. And if you write this from the very beginning with the idea that you might want to parallelize this, then you can write code which is generic, where tomorrow if somebody comes up with AVX 1024, it'll just be a little tune and then it'll spit out the right code for that new platform. And you can verify it once and for all. And then you can specialize and compile to each target architecture. And for this, we use a special technique called uh, verified metaprogramming in F-star. I won't really describe it, but if you're interested in it, there's also very interesting PL research to be done on how to compile and verify this kind of code. So for Hackle XN, the idea is you first write a scalar spec, which is just a high level specification of the mathematical function. But then the most of your effort is actually in writing this generic vectorized spec, which is a specification as well, but it is implicitly parallelizable. And you prove that this parallel spec is correct. And once you've done that, the next step, which is to implement the parallelized implementation in, in, in C basically, is, is, not, is, is, is standard amount of verification work, but that's not so much. The most of the work is on the left-hand side. And the good news from this is that from, from this verified implementation, you can then compile out 32-bit code, but you can also compile out SIMD vectorized code for many different platforms. So that really speeds up everything. Um, uh, for example, if you wanted to vectorize something like SHA-2, this is one round of the, of the SHA-2 compression function. So what it means is that you're going to take eight words and mix them up and you get eight more words out, right? But when you say word in SHA-2, we actually mean two different things. For SHA-2256, it's 32-bit words. For SHA-2512, it's 64-bit words. So first, to specify even the scalar uh, operation on the right, you have to basically write a spec which is very generic, which says, okay, if it is SHA-2256, you do this. SHA-2512, you do something else. And you can do this in a high-level language like F-star or in something like Coke. And then you can write down your, uh, your transformations. This is your little shuffling function that you're writing down. But the next thing you're going to do is to write the vectorized spec. And the vectorized spec is going to manipulate four SHA-2 states in parallel. The way it's going to do it is going to take your four SHA-2 states. It's going to transpose them so that it becomes an array of vectors. Rather than four arrays, you have an array of vectors where each vector has four elements. Then you apply 
the transposition to these vectors so that it's happening in parallel on all four states. And finally, you untranspose it back to get back the original uh, format, which is the four different uh, SHA-2 states. And this is kind of the standard th way of doing very naive vectorization, where you're not really using anything clever, you're just doing things in parallel for many different inputs. And if you wanted to specify something like that in FSTOR, what you have to first do is define what the width of your vectors is. You could leave it completely unspecified, but in most common uh, use cases, you're going to have a width one, which means scalar, or two, four, eight, 16, these kinds of things. And once you've defined your bits, you can define your state, which is going to be a vectorized state. On the left is the scalar state, on the right is the vectorized state. And then you define your vectorized operations, which turns out look exactly like your scalar operations. It's just that you're doing them in parallel on all of the elements of the vector. And finally, of course, you have to prove that the thing on the right is consistent, let's say, with the thing on the left, which means if you transpose states on the left to the right-hand side form, apply all the right-hand side operations, and then you transpose back, then it is as if you did the operation on the left on each element of the vector. And this is the standard kind of proof technique, which we have many libraries for, and we can do this uniformly. So in HackerLexon, this is what we did. We have many different algorithms that we vectorized to get performance, which now starts getting much better, closer to assembly, hand-optimized assembly code. There is still a small gap, but you can, you can close that even. Um, and you get uh, from one verified implementation, multiple uh, uh, deployable platform-specific implementations for free. So this closes the gap between high assurance and high performance. You can close the back gap even further if you really need to use assembly for something, then you can verify that as that element of the of your code using a language like Vail or Jasmine, and then incorporate it back. And that's what is done in this uh, tool called Evercrypt, where you take verified code from Vail, verified code from Hackle, mix them together. And if you mix them together, you can get performance which beats all the implementations out there. For example, for Curve to Five Seven Nine, even handwritten or hand optimized implementations without any verification. Verified code can beat the performance of this uh, unverified code. So there is no real need or performance-based need for avoiding verified code anymore. Okay, so we know how to close the gap completely towards, uh, towards any assembly or C implementation for many different uh, crypto primitives. So this code that I've been showing you, HackleStar, is actually in deployment. It's, if you're using Firefox, you're using HackleStar or WireGuard or some blockchains, or if you're doing elections with election guard using code from HackleStar. So this is a, a successful uh, cryptographic software. So let's shift uh, a bit for the next, for the last part of the talk towards saying, okay, how we go up the stack, right? So if you remember, this was what we are, our target was. I focused on the bottom part of the stack uh, for most of the talk, but how do you verify the things on top? Okay. So again, Signal, we said it has a fairly innovative protocol design. In fact, if you look inside it, the first part is called, uh, it's a one shot authenticated key exchange called X3DH. Then it's got this key uh, ratcheting mechanism, which provides this novel guarantee called post compromise security. It's got a hash ratcheting mechanism, which provides forward security. And then it's got authenticated encryption uh, scheme, which is fairly standard. What's interesting about this protocol is inherently recursive because with every message, you can change the keys and the new keys depend on the previous keys. So if you want to ask about what is the security of message number 20 in a signal conversation, it depends on the security of the previous key, the previous key, the previous key, all the way back to the X3DH one. So you have to really, it's the, it's, it's, it's a, the, even the security guarantees, uh, if you state of a, of a signal protocol are inherently a recursive inductive guarantee that you get where each message builds upon the security of the previous message. So how do we me mechanically verify that this protocol is secure? And can you prove that it is correct? Well, you can take the protocol and you can formalize it, right? So the, the picture on the right more or less represents all of the operations that are happening in the first two messages in Signal. And if you, if you zoom in on it, even for the first message, before sending the first message, Signal does five Diffie-Hellman operations. So four just to do uh, the initial key and then one more to send the first message. So this is, already like uh, a bit more complicated than TLS in the sense that TLS had only one Diffie-Hellman operation. Here we are doing five Diffie-Hellman operations and each of them is for a different purpose. 
The recipient has three Diffie-Hellman public keys. The initiator has one long-term Diffie-Hellman public key. And then there are many ephemeral Diffie-Hellman public keys all mixed in, okay? But you can formalize this in a formal tool. For example, you can form, write, the, write down this protocol in a tool called Proverif, or, and then analyze whether this protocol is secure under some highly abstract, symbolic abstractions of cryptography and try to find attacks against this protocol. You can also formalize this, this protocol in a, in a protocol in a tool called Cryptoverif, and then do a game-based proof that this protocol is secure. And these things work, and I encourage you to read that paper. But the issue is that uh, since every message, the security of each message depends on the prior messages, the, the state that the tools have to maintain keeps growing, which means after three messages, typically both of these tools at least blow up. I mean, they, they cannot handle the fourth message anymore because the, fourth me the security of the fourth message depends on the third message, depends on the second message and so on. And it gets the, the security becomes harder and harder to prove because these are more or less automated tools. You don't do inductive proofs in this. Uh, you want to prove them by exhaustive search. And so there are limitations to what you can prove, but up to the, fir the first three messages, yes, you can prove all the properties, try to find all the classic attacks on key exchange protocols, and you can do this uh, for, for this protocol. So let's assume that you have a crypto proof for it, either handwritten or, or done with one of these tools. Can you prove that the code for signal is correct? Yes, by using the same kind of thing you were doing for Hackle, you can write the spec, you can, uh, and you can prove in F star that the code matches the spec. Okay, and then you can take this code and you can plug it in back into a signal implementation, and then you get a verified signal implementation in the sense that inside it all the protocol code has been verified. And this was done, you know, in a paper at SNP 2019, where the entire signal implementation was verified and then plugged in back into the signal messenger. Uh, so that you could actually, you could just use it as, a, as part of your messaging application with no, no discernible change. In fact, it was even faster than the previous implementation. Of course, the problem here is that we only have a proof for three, three messages, which is a bit dissatisfying, uh, but we'll see how to improve that. Before doing that, let me kind of also step back for a few minutes and say, okay, so what in the, in the arena of verifying protocols and protocol code, what are the solved problems and what I consider what do I consider the open problems? So today, if you have a brand new crypto protocol for IoT or for your blockchain or for whatever, and you want to analyze the security of this and find all kinds of uh, attacks on the logic of the protocol, yes, you can do it. There's many tools, especially Proverif and Tamarin, where you can code up the protocol, and you can run it and it'll find all kinds of attacks against this protocol. Okay, so many realistic threats you can, you can eliminate by just exhaustively searching for them. Of course, if your protocol has this kind of recursion like, like Signal does, or it has an arbitrary size, like it's a group protocol with unbounded size, then these tools will struggle because they, can, they are doing an exhaustive search. But if you don't have that kind of, uh, those kinds of uh, generalities, you, this is a solved problem. What if you want to have a crypto proof, like a game hopping proof or a simulation based proof or reduction based proof? Can you build a mechanized proof, machine checked proof for your crypto protocol? Yes, but it takes much more work. Okay, so there are tools like CryptoVerif, EasyCrypt, CryptHall, and many others where you can write down uh, mechanized proofs for these protocols in a semi automated way. Often the user needs to provide lots of input, often you need to have a lot of experience. The, Tools that I showed you before, like Proverif and Tamarin, are more or less push button. You push the button and it'll say yes or no. You need expertise, but not as much as for these ones. What about really like new kinds of uh, things that I'm deploying today, like uh, some zero knowledge proof system, multi-party computation, some kind of group key exchange. Can I, can I prove them to be secure using a machine check proof? Possibly, but this is a hot area of research. So this is like ongoing open problems, I welcome you to kind of indulge yourself in this, uh, in this area if you're interested. What about code? Can I prove that my code is correct as in it's actually doing what it's supposed to? Yes, there is a whole bunch of software verification tools now for Rust, for C, for F star, for Haskell that you can use that uh, you can prove that your code is correct. That's no longer, I mean, if, you, if you're concerned about your cryptographic code, you should prove that it's correct. Can you build, can you bridge the two? Can you build a crypto proof, but directly for code? Yes, there are some research projects that have tried to do this. It's a lot of work, 
but you can take a look at these projects and you can actually try to do a crypto proof directly on the deployed code. Sometimes it works. Okay, and the last question. Okay, we started off this talk by saying, let's try to verify the signal messenger. Can we do it? No, <laughs> because it's too big. 30,000 lines of code is not going to be something that any of the tools I've mentioned will scale to. Okay, 30,000 was 10% of signal, right? Um, but if you are able to rewrite that code in some highly specialized way, which will be help your proof, then yes, maybe you can do it. Okay, so let me uh, end the talk by talking about this project, which I'm very excited by. It's joint work with, uh, with Ralph and many of his students at, at Stuttgart and, and Abhishek Bichawat at Gandhinagar, which is called Device Star, where we're really trying to also do security proofs alongside doing these functional correctness proofs in F star. Okay, it's a scalable symbolic security proof for F star protocol code. And the basic idea is you write the code in F star, you write the spec in F star, and then for the spec, you prove security also in F star. To do this, we have built a layered uh, kind of architecture, but at the bottom, we have a very concrete semantics of the global trace of protocols where you can really specify what the, what the security guarantees and the attacker threat model is. On top of this, we have a symbolic abstraction of crypto, which is called the symbolic runtime model, if you will. And on top of that, we build a various proof techniques and abstractions called the labeled security library. But we prove the soundness of these abstractions within the system. And, on, and finally, the, we build uh, protocol models on top of this labeled library. So if you want to write, you model your own protocol in device star, you can ignore everything below it. And you get this nice high, high level abstract API on top of which you can build your protocol code. Okay. And, and that's the thing that you will verify. And that is usually very compact and the verification usually comes, uh, is pretty quick. Okay. And if your protocol code fails to verify, it, it could mean that there's a potential attack. It might mean that you have to provide some more annotations for the proof to go through. So you're building symbolic proofs in F star for your code. And this is the same code that you will then run on the network so that it can, you can even compile it to see our open web assembly in some future version, so that it's actually an efficient, high performance implementation, but with security proofs all within the same system. So I don't have too much time, so I'm gonna skip the taste, but basically just to give an idea of the kinds of proofs that you do, when you do something like signal, if you remember the first message had four Diffie-Hellman operations. So each Diffie-Hellman operation is meant for, to give you a different security guarantee. And this is captured within device star in the notion of secrecy labels. So this is a label of the key that comes out of X3DH, but each of these lines is basically the guarantee given by one of those diffie helmets. So one of them is a static static diffie helmet, one of them is an ephemeral ephemeral, one of two of them are ephemeral static diffie helmets. And each of them, we can carefully characterize the fine grained security guarantees you get from that diffie helmet and combine them all, and then use it to prove the security guarantees of signal. And each of these steps is proved sound within the system. So in using device star, we've already verified things like signal. Uh, and this in fact is the first mechanized proof of signal for an arbitrary number of rounds. So we don't have the limitations of pro verif of crypto verif where we had to limit to three messages, we can go for any number of messages. And it's also a proof for an executable uh, implementation of signal. The verification time in device star is linear, which means it kind of, it, it's very scalable. So it takes a lot more work to do an individual proof, but it doesn't grow exponentially like many other tools, it grows uh, linearly. However, yes, you need to provide annotations. So you need to, it's not, you don't have to write the full proof, but it's also not push button. It's somewhere in between the two. You have to write annotations. And sometimes it could be like, if you write code of thousand lines, you might have to write, I don't know, 500 to 600 lines of annotations, which is, it's a heavy burden, but much less than many other proof uh, systems. So that's what I'm very excited about this year. We have lots of interesting results and hopefully more results in the coming year. Okay, so to conclude uh, the various things that we saw. So what is the good news? The good news is that if you want to verify crypto algorithms, crypto protocols, find attacks, for many of the classic designs, for many of the simple analyses, it's actually more or less a solved problem in the sense that there are interesting research still going on here, but there are many studies, there are good foundations on the basis of which you can start and do interesting things with. But there are other things which are more 
very researchy, maturing active research such as zero knowledge proofs, MPC, FHE, how to verify hand optimized assembly code. This is still, I would say, a little bit on the on the edge of being solved, but I would not call them solved in any way. And there are many, many problems that are really open, in particular, how to prove the absence of various kinds of side channel attacks that have been known for a while. We still don't know how to do that. And of course, all the code that I've shown you, which all the tools that are working here are working on code more or less that people have written for the purpose of verification, as in we were willing to change the code in order to verify it quickly. But often, of course, we want to verify code that has been written by non-verification experts, which security developers, and how to kind of interface between security developers who are writing real code and these verification tools remains an interesting and open challenge and quite unsolved. So if you're interested in this topic, before I uh, leave the to questions, I'm gonna encourage you to uh, show you two links. One is the Vericrypt workshop, which we are holding every year, hopefully, in India in December. Last year, it was co-located with Indocrypt. This year, it's co-located with FSTTCS. Unfortunately, registration is already closed for this year, but you can attend next year, look at that website. And there are many open internships, PhDs, and postdoc uh, positions in this zone. Please communicate with me if you're interested. There are job offers in Indria, but also I know of job offers at uh, Stuttgart and Microsoft Research. So there's very uh, lots of interesting research to be done. I'm a little bit over time, but I'm gonna stop now. So thank you very much, Karthik, uh, for this uh, very inspiring uh, and, and uh, nice talk. Um, so we have time for questions. Are there questions? I see there's something already in the uh, chat. Um, so let me read out the first one. Um, what are the present challenges if you want to verify any implementation in JavaScript or we want to verify a whole large code written in JavaScript, rather only small code written in C? Thank you for that question. Um, so um, JavaScript is, uh, okay, if you write your code directly in JavaScript and then you want to verify it, it's traditionally considered a very hard problem because of the semantics of JavaScript is, is particularly naughty, especially if you use all the features of JavaScript. But there are many approaches which work well here. So among the things that I showed you, all of the code that uh, we verify in FSTAR, you can compile to C, but you can also compile them to WebAssembly and WebAssembly with a JavaScript wrapper around it. So you can use, if WebAssembly is in fact, now in most of JavaScript frameworks, uh, you can execute Java WebAssembly within JavaScript. So that's, uh, if you want to use the tools I talked about and actually take the verified code and put it into JavaScript, it's already done. You can do it right now. If you want to write your code in JavaScript and verify it, you'll have to follow very strict discipline. So there is various proposals that people have made, including SES, including defensive JavaScript, and many other subsets of JavaScript. If you write your code in those subsets of JavaScript, then yes, we can apply some of these verification tools to them. But if you're going to take a general purpose JavaScript app of, I don't know, 30,000 lines, I would say it's hopeless to verify. Okay, thank you. We have um, another question. Do you feel crypto cryptographers need to create simpler schemes without compromising security? Or is security the only priority and programmers need to uh, be careful? This is an interesting question. And I think uh, in, people are really wrestling with this already in the, in the NIST post-quantum uh, competition where there are some schemes which uh, seem to be harder to implement securely than others. And this has become a question, a bone of contention as to whether this should be, um, uh, this should be a disqualifying feature. You, know, this, you might have a super secure scheme, but maybe it's, it's hard to implement correctly. So I would say that uh, indeed, uh, it is the responsibility of a cryptographic designer to write their own implementation at least once and show how this can be done securely. And if it is, you have to jump through many hoops to, uh, to implement your scheme securely, then uh, it's just irresponsible to put it out there, I would say. Um, so that's what I feel, but you know, I'm, I'm not designing crypto schemes, so maybe I'm uh, biased from the other side. Okay, so let me ask uh, one more question from the chat and then we 
uh, um, we go to the to the floor and ask there. So, um, so this is an interesting question uh, about documentation. So, how far can one go in terms of protocol verification when the protocols are described in English only, uh, uh, and that also is purely documented? Uh, for example, Intel, Intel SGX. Yes, yeah, so I don't want to indulge in SGX bashing here, but uh, I, I understand the pain that the questioner is expressing here. Uh, I agree that there is a, uh, a problem in terms of, uh, there is always going to be a gap. I mean, I tried to, I kind of jumped over it in some sense saying, oh, from the RFC, you can go to a spec very easily. It might be true for certain kinds of crypto specs where it's basically a mathematical function being described in words and pseudocode, maybe writing a formal spec is not so hard, but a lot of specifications are not like this, especially protocol specifications. So recently, uh, Ralph and his students and, and in collaboration with me, we built a, uh, a model of the ACME protocol, which is hundreds of pages, or at least almost hundred pages of text. And it's not trivial to kind of figure out whether or not you're correctly um, uh, modeling and formalizing this kind of uh, protocol. So one solution I see coming forward is uh, to try to develop specification languages that uh, authors of specifications can use and embed within their spec. But these specification languages are far formal with the formal semantics. So one of the languages we're developing in my team is called HackSpec, and it's getting a little bit of traction. And the idea behind HackSpec is indeed to write to write formal specifications of crypto primitives and maybe some parts of protocols in a way that is executable, in a way that can be translated to F-star, to COC, to EasyCrypt, and these kinds of things, but is also very succinct and readable. So something that you can put in place of pseudocode, let's say, within your spec. Uh, that's, again, much easier to do for things like crypto primitives, but maybe much harder to do for things like protocols. Uh, and much, even much harder to do for things like APIs like SGX, because there you have to, uh, you have to really wrestle with, uh, with a lot more constraints and a much larger committees of users and developers uh, than the ones that I'm speaking of. But this is a valid, uh, and as, as far as I know, unsolved question. Okay, so let me give the people at the venue uh, a chance to ask questions. Do we have questions there? Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Vargam, uh, for your wonderful talk on high performance uh, cryptographic subgrades with high assurance. So here, many of the participants are at the venue and they would like to ask a few questions, a couple of questions there. So uh, dear participant, anyone is having any questions then? So uh, my question uh, is this, that JavaScript is widely used because of its language uh, feature richness. And the moment you go for the verification, you have to reduce that those features. So can we see uh, in near future when we can use a uh, full feature rich JavaScript with formal verification like we have in hardware industry? I suspect uh, that JavaScript Full JavaScript is hopeless. I think JavaScript in strict mode, maybe, uh, which is actually still quite expressive. Huh? I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the problematic features of JavaScript for verification are features that most people never use. Okay, it is just that some it is something that we have to be aware of because the attacker might use it. So the, so if I want to make a little, uh, uh, the problem with JavaScript is that if I want to make a little uh, component which I verified and I put it inside a much larger JavaScript implementation, the outside JavaScript implementation can redefine the prototypes in a way that all my crypto on the inside and my secret keys on the inside are completely leaked to the environment. So if I put it on a page where there is some malicious JavaScript on the outside, I can give you no guarantees about it. With WebAssembly, we can give a few more guarantees, but again, not very strong guarantees in the current, uh, current setting. With, if you promise that your entire web page is using strict JavaScript, we can give you some more guarantees. So JavaScript is a hard target because it was designed to really allow anything, anybody to change any behavior of, <laughs> of any object. And so that's particularly hard. Okay. So uh, 
Uh, if you so use uh, subsets like uh, you know the Facebook subset or React or know, or, uh, or uh, TypeScript, then again you might get some good guarantees. Uh, but uh, overall JavaScript is hard. But most people in the field now are focusing on Rust because with Rust we think that even giving all the features of Rust, we can still give you good guarantees. Uh, but JavaScript, not so sure. Okay, so that means as we are heading toward more JavaScript in web application and other places, so that means we are heading toward more insecurity. Yes, yes, unless uh, unless uh, you impose uh, self-impose some limitations on the code that you will deploy, and uh, there is possible there are ways of doing this. If you are talking about uh, scenarios where you have isolation features like frames. You can say, okay, I'm going to guarantee that everything within this frame is secure, and there's, it's only communicating with the other frames in a certain particular way. But if you're going to drop all of your code in a sea of JavaScript on a sing within a single origin, uh, I cannot give you any guarantees at this at this in this day. Yes, yes. Thank you. Any of these participated? Anyone would like to ask any question? Okay. Otherwise, I also have another question in the chat. I could ask that one and probably the final question because uh, then we are running out of time. Um, it's a it's a general question about like like usability. So how can mathematician uh, math students with zero knowledge of computer science can learn or build these types of program implementations? And uh, so how is it like it's it's essentially what you said on your last slide like how how can we uh life like give non-experts ability to to do some kind of verification no it's a it's a good question um so uh and it's not hopeless uh i mean i'm, I'm quite positive about the answer to this because it depends on what you what kind of implementations you're thinking okay so if you are a math uh student let's say and you have a new scheme for doing uh, uh, some kind of uh, homomorphic encryption using some kind of field arithmetic and you want an implementation of it uh, it is possible for you to write your scheme fairly nicely fairly mathematical form in say cock and then use the fiat crypto framework to automatically compile it to c so you don't need to know the low level details of c or computer science you write your thing in these high level mathematical descriptions and gets compiled okay uh, there are some other proposals like this where you can write mathematically oriented let's say uh, algorithms and then it gets compiled to provably correct uh, low level code which is very efficient so you don't actually ever have to write that so that's uh, one plus uh, for you uh, the negative is that almost always uh, for new schemes these days, performance is a big constraint. I mean, it's uh, the, the reason uh, a lot of the very nice cryptography we've had already for 15, 20 years was never deployed widely was because they were never performant enough. And now maybe they will get deployed. Even Elliptica of Diffie-Hellman was the first time when people wanted to then deploy Diffie-Hellman everywhere, which means that if performance ends up being a big concern, you will have to learn some computer science in order to optimize the code. Otherwise, uh, it just will not, nobody will use it. So uh, you can get started very quickly, I would say, using uh, verified libraries for uh, which are already available or these kinds of compilers, uh, which will allow you to write your thing in a very intuitive way and then compile it down. But that's just the first version. The first version you can do very quickly. But then you probably should communicate with some computer science students and get them to improve your uh, implementation after that. Okay, so some advertisement for computer science. <laughs> very good. So with this, um, thank you very much, uh, Karthik, uh, for this exciting talk. Um, and well, hope to see you soon. Thank you thank very you much. So much guys. Thank you. This was a great pleasure. And Thanks honor. for being here.
thank you professor bhargavan for such a nice and interesting talk and we are really enriched by your uh, discussion today and thank you professor uh, ralph and uh, professor kor for chairing this session uh, the next session will start at 3:45 but before we go for the next session i have small announcement as our chief guest professor bimal roy is uh, leaving so for the uh, for him we have a small token of appreciation from the whole organizing committee so i would request dr kor to give professor bimal roy to uh, our token of appreciation thank you